Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Faith from Elastic's community team. Today's meetup, CISO Enablement Track, Advanced Threat Hunting and Monitoring with Elastic APM, is brought to you by Capgemini's Insights and Data Meetup Group, as well as Elastic's Amer Virtual User Group. Um, so today's topics, the first is going to be uh, CISO enablement with preventative, detective, and responsive solutions. That's going to be brought to you by um, our friends at Capgemini Financial Services, um, Ayush Sharma, Ashwin Parmar, and Rajesh Iyer. And then the second part of our presentation today is going to be from Elastic on advanced Threat Hunting and Monitoring with Elastic APM, and that'll be uh, presented by Ruben Perez, who's a solutions architect here at Elastic. Um, so a few notes. Um, if you're coming to us from the Elastic virtual user group, we encourage you to check out Capgemini's uh, Insights and Data Meetup. Um, it's a great place for networking, and um, there I'll, I'll send some links into the chat to the regional groups that we encourage you to join. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand things off to Rajesh. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rajesh Iyer. I head up the Artificial Intelligence Group for Financial Services at Capgemini. I'm here along with my colleagues from Capgemini, Ashwin Parmar, who's my boss and heads up all the different uh, practices area within Capgemini. And then I also have Ayush Sharma, who's our go-to-market lead for um, Capgemini. So if you have any questions that you want to get a hold of us on, now you sure might probably your best bet. With that, I'll start my presentation on cybersecurity analytics. Uh, before I step into that, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about Capgemini itself. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of Capgemini or don't know a lot about it, we're about 50 years uh, um, uh, old company. We started in 1967 out of France. Uh, we're fairly um, large right now. I'd say it was considerably larger than that, that at this point in time. We're a global leader. We provide three kinds of services. One is um, uh, along the lines of management consulting. We have a group called Invent that does that. And then we have a group that does technology. Uh, uh, and then we have a group that does business services. And then we have a service that, or several services that cut, cut across all of them. They're called Global Business Lines. And we're part of a group called uh, Insights and Data, which is a global service line. Uh, right now, as you can see on the screen, we're 210,000 employees, but with the recent acquisition of a very large company called Altran, or at least a relatively large company called Altran, that's actually up to 250,000. Uh, we're in 44 countries. Uh, the uh, annual turnover, which is actually revenue for us in the U.S., it's a 13.2 billion. That's probably after the Altran acquisition or Altran acquisition, about 17 billion. We have 25 innovation centers and 6,000 plus clients across the globe. Um, we have a fairly good presence when it comes to clients. We have nine of the top 15 banks, 12 of the top 15 investment banks, 12 of the top 15 insurance companies, eight of the top 15 asset finance companies, and nine of the top consumer finance companies. So we're trusted by large clients across the globe. Uh, beyond that, we also have a fairly strong domain focus as well. So um, we have a, um, actually sub strategic business units for insurance and banking. Uh, so we have deeply uh, sort of experienced people within the insurance group as well as for the banking group. In terms of our capabilities, it's really the data value chain all the way from going and finding data organizing the data, governing the data, getting the data together, arranging the data for analytics, and then doing BI slash analytics on that and also advanced analytics visualization and deployment, those kinds of things. When we think about our way of working with clients, I would say that we like to adopt a collaborative, collaborative style so we're not doing things to or for our clients, we're doing it, doing it with our clients most of the time. So we try to be outcome aligned and we try to be very, very flexible when it comes to different engagement models. And if you don't have one that sort of works for you and you have an idea for that, we're always willing to listen uh, to ideas. Uh, and we also deliver at scale. So we just have over the last 50 years uh, delivered big and small projects. And over the time, we've actually created methodologies that sort of ensure good delivery practice. We're also known for our thought leadership in financial services. So we actually bring out a bunch of different uh, research uh, pro uh, reports like um, the uh, world reports and FinTech, world reports and insurance, world reports and payments and so on and so forth. 
I should also uh, give a shout out to the people at Capgemini here uh, on the Capgemini Research Institute side because they're one of the best ranked um, in-house thought leadership or think tanks uh, in the industry. Going to the next slide, it's a little bit about insights and data. I'll just talk about the number of people we have to give you a sense of scale, but then I'll skip over the rest and then I think we'll get into the topic of cybersecurity analytics. So we're 16,000 professionals across 40 plus countries and you can see all the countries where we're represented. And as we said, they sort of run the gamut from uh, getting data and organizing data to actually delivering insight and deploying insight into, into transactional systems. Last slide about Capgemini, I promise, and this is actually some uh, sense of credentials of Capgemini when it comes to insights and data. So uh, on the Gartner, Everest, and Nelson Hall uh, evaluation of vendors that provide services in the space, we come out pretty strong in all those evaluations, so we're rather proud of that. With that, we'll skip to what the big motivation is for people to do cybersecurity analytics today. So there, there have been sort of like an evolution in three separate dimensions that's driving an increasing need for uh, more, better, more effective cybersecurity analytics. One is along the technologies and this sort of explosion in terms of from an infrastructure standpoint, network standpoint, endpoint standpoint, the number of technologies that are coming into play and the number of vendors that are coming into play has just made it a very, very complicated situation with all kinds of new threats sort of coming into the realm because of all these new technologies from different vendors and so on. The second dimension that's actually uh, worrying people that sort of are responsible for the CISO and uh, CISO offices is the threats are evolving as well uh, from the standpoint of um, uh, so, so some negligent sort of problems with, with uh, the threats there are threats from uh, non-feasance as opposed to misfeasance, I would say, uh, all the way to like state-sponsored threats that we're seeing today. Um, that gives you a sense of the kinds of people that are involved with uh, these, uh, um, or I should say the kinds of bad actors we're seeing um, has really gotten um, a lot of different kinds of people. So we see that, and also the amount of um, sophistication they have in terms of the threats that they can actually uh, perpetrate on, on our systems has actually grown as well. And then of course, regulation expectations as well as from PCI DSS to HIPAA and PSD2 and so on and so forth. There's more and more scrutiny on the system that we actually use for uh, um, preventing against vulnerabilities, detecting threats, so a lot of times we are called upon to explain uh, the systems that we have and, and there needs to be some assurance that we need to give to regulators that we have a great system or good enough system to, to avoid threats and also that we're actually following that system. I think that's always a good start. Uh, uh, it's, it's possible in the cybersecurity threat space that we can't prevent 100% of the threats that sort of come to our door but we ought to be able to actually explain to regulators what the process we have is and how we actually follow those processes to do the best job we can to protect our data and our users' uh, privacy and so on and so forth. The next one is kind of like, a, um, uh, gives you a perspective as to how to think about uh, uh, threat protection. So if you really think about how um, castles work, at least the historic castles with the moats and multiple walls and redundant protection zones, so on and so forth. I think that, you know, this is, a, this is a great metaphor for, I think that we can build systems based on what you've seen in the past, but then there's always new emerging polymorphic threats that it's very hard to uh, defend against. So from that perspective, it becomes very, very important for us to not just look at things we've seen in the past, but also the things that just look weird that uh, warrant an investigation. On the next slide, what we're switching to is how we think about uh, bringing the best of cybersecurity analytics to our clients. And I'll focus on the picture here, which talks about uh, in the blue area there, or the blue line, we're talking about security research. And what that refers to is the fact that we're, we're trying to be very in abreast of what's going on in the cybersecurity world, both in terms of threats and how you actually defend yourself against the threats, 
or threats that have already happened and how you actually remediate once the threats have happened. So uh, from a forensic standpoint, understanding what's out there is what the security research aspect talks about. The second aspect is the client objectives and environment. So it's good that we know what's happening in the industry, but we also try to do a pretty good job uh, or a thorough job, I should say, uh, not a good job that's up to the client to decide in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and what are the specific threats uh, that uh, is peculiar to their industry, their operation, and so on. And uh, that sort of informs the kinds of solutions that we bring. And of course, the data science aspect of it, which is all about looking at the data, how we pre-process the data, how we bring it together to basically uh, uh, sort of bubble up the, uh, the potential threats and then basically be smart enough about not bringing all those two uh, SME subject matter experts, but just be very, very um, uh, smart about just bringing the really, really relevant ones or the ones that get bubbled up. Uh, sometimes it's through actually combining multiple data science approaches. Sometimes it's about uh, sort of combining the data science approach with SME intervention to make sure that we're bringing the best possible threats for people to actually action. So we combine these three things in terms of how we actually build applications in the cyber, cyber security analytics space. On the next slide, what we're talking about is um, uh, how do we go from data uh, or what gets produced naturally by the various systems and endpoints and so on and so forth to actually um, well, finding things that need to be bubbled up if it's not already uh, causing damages or if it's actually causing damages, how do you find what the root cause is and go fix the root cause. So here we're just showing you a funnel based approach uh, from the top. We're showing you the kinds of things that feed data into us that are produced naturally through normal activities. And then basically we uh, apply a security lens through it through SIMS and AI machine learning in terms of bubbling up anomalous activities. And then on top of that, we um, provide some kind of domain, I shouldn't say, we provide uh, good domain and technology expertise on top of that to uh, be uh, careful about curating exactly what we want to show uh, experts to action. Uh, potential threats is basically looking at uh, things to action. And sometimes we're able to also um, uh, not only say this is a problem, we could also provide some insight as to how they might be remediated. Uh, so that's that. And then the last one is, of course, investigations and threat containment, where something's already happened. How do you actually um, uh, go find the thing that's sort of ostensibly looking uh, uh, like a problem and uh, has caused damage back to what the root cause of that is so we can go back and fix that? On the next slide, we are talking about Capgemini Security Analytics Services Portfolio. It's like, a, as you can see, an end-to-end -end offering. So there's three parts to it. The first part is the threat synthesis and uh, contextualization. The second part is detection. And the third part is defense and response to it. So under threat synthesis and contextualization, we're talking about we provide advisory services uh, when it comes to security and threat assessment. Uh, we also provide design and architecture services in terms of tool evaluation recommendation. Uh, we have some sort of specific thoughts about how we can uh, uh, um, get started quickly using uh, some, some stuff that we have from partners. Of course, uh, Elastic being a good example of that, we'll get into that in just a few minutes. And then also setting up the target operating model in terms of uh, how do you set up uh, the people uh, process technology interventions or, or structures to both catch threats, um, uh, sort of to prevent damage and also to remediate threats after they've happened. Under the detection uh, chevron at the top, there's multiple, I guess, classes of use cases or applications that we try to build. The first one is the user and entity behavior analysis. And what we're talking about here are the kinds of use cases where we're looking for when we combine the user that's involved plus the infrastructure they're, uh, they're um, uh, interacting with, basically looking at that uh, from a behavioral standpoint and surfacing things that might actually look odd. So for example, you have uh, um, uh, certain amounts of data going out uh, for a particular user group compared to peers. 
uh, during the weekdays and we see a different pattern for the weekend, we can actually look at for a specific user if that sort of uh, data movement pattern looks the same as the peers both during the weekday and weekend and then try to actually surface things when it looks odd. So for example, you might see that the rest of the peer group has uh, low data movement over the weekend days, but then you might have a specific user that has a high level of usage and you want to actually be able to bubble that up. Uh, the second kind of use case is breach intelligence. So we're talking about uh, looking at just a lot of times just what we're seeing within the infrastructure telemetry uh, and logs and, and uh, some don't always have to have uh, reference to the user, but then just from looking at what's coming from the logs and telemetry, can I tell if something's odd or are there examples? And this, by the way, applies to both one and two. On top of being able to tell or call out anomalous behavior, there might be past history of uh, things that were investigated and actually actioned. If we have that on top of anomaly detection, we can also build predictive models that basically says, um, you know, based on what I'm seeing for this user, for this infrastructure, uh, in the past, when you've seen these things, they've tended to be problems. So you should probably look at this one because this looks like you would have actually done something with this. So you did something with this in the past, looking at the past data, I can tell that you've done something with this in the past. Therefore, I'm asking you to look at it. The third one is dashboards and reporting. What we're talking about there is um, rather than just doing the detection part, how do I actually bring that to the user in a way that they, that's consumable? So if I just start pushing out lots of tables and data to people, it's very hard for people, even experts of this, uh, uh, in this uh, field, to be able to um, find what they need to find. So I think there's a, uh, there's a bit of design that can go into how we design visualizations, dashboards, and reports so that we're focusing the experts on the right kinds of things. And the last one is threat forensics. What we're talking about here is, of course, the last piece of the funnel diagram where once we see that the threats happened and it's starting to cause damage or has already caused damage, what can you do to actually trace it back to the root cause and go remediate that? The last chevron here in terms of our offering is the defend and response stuff, which is basically, can we actually help with creating operations procedures or operations manuals for SOCs? and then goes beyond that to providing actual SOC support for our clients. This is where I wanna spend a little bit more time, so I'll probably spend five, six minutes on the slide in terms of what we're trying to uh, do that's different than your uh, plain vanilla cybersecurity analytics approaches. And the simplest way that I can explain how we approach this is we take a very paranoid AI approach uh, and what that means is that um, rather than relying on one AI uh, ferreting out uh, anomalies or ferreting out things that need to be remediated uh, from the standpoint of what we've learned from past data that required remediation, we're actually building multiple models and multiple ways of looking at these things and having them kind of uh, uh, vote, if you will, on whether something is a problem and whether it needs to be remediated, right? So. As I'm going through this stuff, just think of paranoid AI as fundamentally how we think we're trying to come up with uh, a good cybersecurity analytics system that brings the best curated threats for people to action rather than just create an explosion of things for people to look at. I think that's really a problem with a lot of the solutions today is the number of false positives that people have to deal with. If you look across the top, what are the things that are required in terms of building out a, a good solution? Uh, there's a little bit about data collection, I should say, that's kind of uh, important. And there's some post-processing required, uh, sorry, pre-processing that's required depending on uh, where you're getting the data from. If you're getting stuff from, uh, from uh, infrastructure, you might be able to use um, uh, information like uh, um, uh, uh, memory utilization, CPU utilization, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you might get those as quantitative uh, uh, metrics, but then if you look at applications, APIs, and containers, uh, those won't make a whole lot of sense. And what you have to do with that stuff is actually uh, resort to what we call synthetics, which is basically looking at uh, the, the metrics that are coming out in terms of 
uh, delayed latency of applications and things like that that might actually give you or clue you in on what the problems might be. Um, so there's on top of the sort of metrics that come directly to us or metrics that need to be created like the synthetics, there's also a bunch of logs that become available to us that we can leverage as well. Uh, some logs, uh, it's easy for us to handle because they look like standard logs, but sometimes we also get some non-standard logs, in which case there's the need to pre-process that information. The whole point is uh, whether we were looking, so I'm actually looking at the left-hand side here, networks or servers slash VMs or applications or APIs or containers or files, uh, what uh, needs to happen from all those different uh, things is we need to get uh, KPIs and we don't want to look at KPIs at one single point in time. We want to look at a time series of these KPIs and use those to drive how we look for threats. Um, in the second column here, we're talking about um, basically the categories of data that come out of the sources of data, which was in the last blocks that I read. So as I said before, there's telemetry data, there's some IoT data we could have access to, there's some log data. And then of course, uh, Ruben, uh, my friend from Elastic is gonna talk about APM and how they could provide a rich source of data for cybersecurity analytics. So in the second chevron there, log parsing, aggregation and processing, I touched on that a little bit. It's part of the data collection phase. It's just part of the pre-processing phase. And then as I said before, uh, in the AI and machine learning chevron, which is a gold chevron, uh, the third chevron there, it's all about how do we actually look at uh, um, uh, weirdnesses in, in transactions and so on and so forth from multiple different ways. So I've seen many vendors talk about uh, anomalies, but there's like so many different kinds of anomalies. So there might be outlier anomalies, there might be novelty anomalies, there might be compression anomalies, which is where basically you compress the data and try to decompress it and see if there's anything weird about the reconstruction that we did. There's, uh, from a factorization, we might actually try to do the same thing. From a frequency anomaly, so there's, for example, an algorithm called uh, restricted bolts from machines that looks at, uh, uh, for example, a combination of features that should show up like 3% of the time suddenly start showing up like 15% of the time that might give you another clue into what kind of uh, weirdness we're looking at. All that to say, we're basically looking for multiple uh, perspectives on weirdness, and then we use those as actually additional variables to basic variables that we had from before, and then using all those, and in cases where we have past examples of where uh, SMEs have looked at the output that came out and said, yes, this is actually a problem that needs action, uh, in those cases, we're actually using that data to build a further prediction engine. So we use the basic data, we add the anomaly data on top of that, and then we used historical data as to what was actioned and what was not actioned to build a prediction engine to drive uh, what we are actually throwing in front of folks. So once we have that um, uh, together, both from an anomaly standpoint as well as prediction standpoint, we try to throw it up on a UI generally. Uh, so uh, sometimes we actually try to drive it through Kibana, which, uh, which I think uh, Ruben is going to talk about. But then sometimes we also think that there's a graph visualization that can be helpful. So this is where we're talking about insights. How do we deliver insights, which is the green share run at the top after AI and machine learning, is presenting that anomaly information, presenting that prediction information, presenting the root causes. We do that through dashboards as, as well as graph visualization. And that's what we're showing to security analysts Hopefully what we have done uh, relative to other vendors in the space is that when other vendors in this space are showing a thousand alerts, we're showing a lot fewer alerts than that for um, uh, actioning. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we're doing everything possible to give the, um, the SMEs a fighting chance at actually actioning this. I'm gonna flip it over. Ruben is gonna talk about APM in just a minute. Before that, I just wanna talk about a brand new technology that, that we're focusing at at Capgemini, which is on the next slide. Uh, I'll skip this one on this one. I just want to talk about this because I'm about out of time. The latest technology that we're starting to play around with is called topological data analysis. And what that lets us do is basically represent uh, uh, observations as um, space, basically points in n-dimensional space. 
and then basically looking at the shape of data. So what, what do we mean when we're talking about shape of data? We're talking about things like uh, adjacencies. We're talking about things like distances. We're talking about things about the closeness or openness of data. And the real awesome power of topological data analysis, and by the way, this has been around since um, 2000, so it's about 20 years old, it took a lot of time to actually start driving value out of this, but I think we're at a critical juncture now where we can start driving data out of it. The biggest value that we get out of this is that we might be able to actually do some very quick uh, analysis in terms of taking the data that's coming out of all those sensors, whether it's text or numbers, and basically looking at uh, um, um, uh, the text data without doing a lot of pre-processing and also looking at all data in terms of as time series as opposed to a cross section and time, and then basically looking at what things are clustered together. From a practical standpoint, the neat thing about top topological data analysis is that if you find just a few examples, so imagine you're sitting in a, in a, in a security operations center, if you find one, two, or just a few things that are problematic, it's very, very easy to go and try uh, to do a visualization that tells you other observations that are very, very close to the problematic things that you found, where you have to actually action it. And then you say, for example, in this, I have circled a small uh, set of blue dots, and you see that the blue dots there are problems. They're actually bot problems, but there are some gray ones in there. We don't show all the gray ones because the blue ones are hiding uh, that, but we can actually magnify this stuff. And we can see that there's a lot of gray dots in that group as well, where you're saying, hey, these, got, these things actually got surfaced, but then there's some gray stuff that didn't get surfaced. What's the issue with that? Can I actually open that up and see what's going on with those things? So in this, there's like a lot of blue dots, but even with just a few observations, you might be able to basically say, okay, there's this three or four things that look like this kind of problem. Can I actually do a quick TDA and see what things look like this so I can go action that? So that's the end of my part of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Ruben to really talk about um, the red box here, the APM, which is basically application monitoring data that's coming from uh, uh, the systems and how those actually get used in cybersecurity analytics. Ruben, over to you. Appreciate it, Rajesh. Um, thank you, folks. If you didn't catch it in the beginning, my name is Ruben Perez. I'm a solution architect with Elastic, and today we'll be talking about um, APM. So let me start sharing my screen here. Now, if you guys can indulge me, would you mind if, if you've used anything in Elastic prior or heard of Elastic prior to today, could you do me a favor in the chat, just put a plus in, in how you heard of it or, or how you're using it? And could you give me a double plus if you actually are leveraging our application performance monitoring um, and how you're using all that, just to get a sense of how we can wrap this up at the end. Um, okay, with that said, I hope everyone can see my screen. I have a pretty long or longish deck, but I'm just gonna give you guys a few slides before we jump into uh, a demo. Uh, unless you guys have more questions and then feel free to uh, fire up the chat and I'll do my best and Rajesh can keep me honest in terms of uh, answering those questions. Um, so for those who aren't aware, APM or application performance monitoring is one of our solutions that we provide within our Elastic Suite. And effectively, it helps you retrieve uh, host level information as well as services and application in real time or as best as you can uh, programmatically to, to make sure that your system is not only performant, but behaving properly. And, and by that, I mean it's not having any issues, any errors. Uh, if there are, our APM agent will highlight that uh, within our, our system, and then you can visualize that within our user interface Kibana. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a quick architecture of, of how APM fits into your, your enterprise, your network, right? So we have APM that can track your log information, your infrastructure metrics and things of that nature. As I mentioned, we have APM that could fit with your software applications. Uh, DevOps folks are very interested in that. And then we have our APM agents that can track some more of your containerized uh, data sets if you have containers and things of that nature like Kubernetes and whatnot. 
our APM agent and, and server support a whole slew of technologies from our, our different code bases, Java, Python, Go, .NET, Node.js, and Ruby, all the way to real user monitoring with the, the favorite uh, browser of your choice, as well as the uh, Apple and Android markets. We also support the Angular, Vue, and React frameworks for those who are interested. Now, I'm gonna pause my slide right here and actually jump into a real world example or how I'd like to call it. Again, if you guys would indulge me, go to your favorite uh, search browser or whatnot. And, and what I want you to do, or at least imagine with me, because this is setting up how we're gonna do our scenario within uh, Kibana, is type what I would call a, a potential malicious um, entry in a free form text box. So I have it copied in, so I can paste it and save some time here. Now, on the surface, most search uh, components might see this and say, I don't know what necessarily you're looking for, so I might just spit out gobbledygook or I couldn't find what you're looking for, or something to that effect. But me being the malicious end user that I am, I'm actually trying to trigger my executable that's in this URL site path with these particular um, flags so that I could potentially get into your system via website injection attack and then grab PII or, or other, other business information that I should not have as a malicious user. Now, most uh, search providers will handle this in, in a number of ways. One being translating that whatever search text you, you have into an actual string field instead of something else. But that, that's not quite what I want to get into. That's a whole nother talk for another day. What I wanna impress upon you guys is when you enter something like this, this would go through your code for that, that services your website and get stored in a log or something somewhere. And to be quite honest, it might not be captured because this might not trigger an error behind the scenes. It might just say, I couldn't find what the end user was searching for and I'll move on. Hey, Ruben, there's hey. Ayush. Um, yeah, I think we can't see your screen. Oh, no. Hold on. I was talking for a good two minutes there without that. My bad. Did you guys see the deck before I jumped out? No? Yeah. yeah yes, maybe uh, last part. Okay, my bad. All right, so all I did was fire up Google.com and enter this search screen. So my apologies, folks. Thank you, Ayush, for, for pausing me before I got too far into the weeds. So getting back to what I was saying, this request might just get logged somewhere. And depending on how your DevOps team and your security team are set up, you might not capture this entry. Now on the surface, again, it could just be a, a, a search that did not yield any results. But me being the malicious end user that I am, that's perfect for me. Because now I found a, a potential backdoor into your system, into your network to grab uh, whatever information I want, to be honest. What I'd like to show you guys with our systems is how our APM component can not only help leverage any particular errors in a code that might be triggered by something like this, but then how that's fed into our SIM threat hunting solution that could then help prevent future uh, injection attacks. So I already have my demo system fired up. And what we're looking at here is a, a sample of a machine learning um, visualization that, um, that's showing anomalies in, in the system. This site uh, had various code uh, transactions that were going on with various users that are triggering said transactions. Now, a quick blurb about what's going on here. Uh, within our Elastic system, specifically machine learning, when it shows anomalies, the darker the red hue or, or I guess brighter the red is, is a better term, uh, the more anomalous it is. Now, anomalies, depending on, on who the observer is, could be positive or negative. In this scenario that we're talking about, anomalies are bad, they're negative, and, and we want to make sure we nip it in the bud as, as quickly as possible. Now, the, the information that's being presented to me, again, I have my left nav of all my, my offending users or, or uh, 
influencers that are, are triggering this anomaly as well as the transactions that are doing the same. And it, it propagated the highest anomaly, which is a severity score of 94. Now there's a lot of math that's involved to get that percentage and that score. Uh, I just wanna highlight it because it's higher than any of it, its uh, predecessors that were under it in, in that uh, table view. Quick note, we know that the influencers again are by the particular transaction that's going on and the most influenced or the, the, the highest influencer of all the possible influencers that are on the left is this Dale M character. And it's found for the code call update owner that's happening on in my website. So what's going on is I went to the website, I wanted to change my address, for example, and I clicked update owner. And that for whatever reason is triggering an anomalous event. The particular machine learning job that we have going on for this is a high mean transaction duration. So something that took longer than I expect basically. What we can do is go ahead and jump into the APM analysis of this anomalous event and see if I can drill down into what particularly is the issue. Now, I see a few graphs that are presented to me in, in a, a chart of sorts. One thing I want you guys to note, if, if you haven't used our machine learning uh, components, I highly suggest that you do. But for those that haven't, this shaded area is something that's being uh, triggered by my machine learning job. And I, I, wanna, I wanna dig a little bit deeper into it. So as I sort of drill in and getting more detailed in terms of, of the stats that are being presented, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the transactions that were going on down here, this update owner propagated to the top. And this correlates to what we just saw in the last screen because that was the highest uh, anomalous event given those two influencers that are that, that's the highest influence, influencer for the anomalous event that we saw. So I'll go ahead and click in on that. And again, I'm presented with additional information. Uh, specifically, I wanna point you guys out to, to this transaction duration time. Now it's highlighting this one that took particularly uh, eight seconds, but you can see that there are a couple that are taking longer than expected. And this is our whole APM stack view of the update owner call. It, it triggers a put API call that translates to an HTTP request, gets down to another put uh, from the API all the way down to this validate zip code. Now, prior to the validate zip code, we got this error that was triggered. We'll go ahead and click on this error and see this, this information. This is the culprit of that particular error. Again, it could have triggered our, our long wait time and that would be propagated up in the APM stack view that we were talking about. Again, I wanna impress upon you this particular error message and tie it back to what that funky Google request that I made before. Imagine instead of these ones and twos and ones, which is an invalid zip code that uh, someone entered when they were updating their information, imagine that being this, this uh, executable request through your, your browser that could show up as an invalid search request, right? Our APM agent can effectively not only highlight that there was an invalid request that could have taken too long of a time, which would trigger our machine learning job, it could give you the line of code that it actually got hung up in. So from a DevOps perspective, this is great because now I know where I can go to go fix my code to address these issues. But let's say by that point, this particular attack might have been too late unless this information is being fed into our security side of the house uh, with our SIM threat detection solution. So with the release of APM 7.6, we can now push APM specific data into our SIM solution and leverage that by generating what we call detections. Detections are, um, Consider it a, a predefined um, alert of sorts that if something were to trigger said detection, the SIM solution would then let the end user know, most notably the security team, that something that you triggered before is definitely happening again and you guys should go in and, and hunt and potentially prevent this uh, from occurring and, and reoccurring. 
and let me go ahead and check out our managed solutions. Now, with the release of 7.6, we do have four built-in APM-specific uh, signal detection rules, but that, that doesn't necessarily limit you to just those four. You can go ahead and set up something that is, is watching exactly what I entered here in the Google, where it says, uh, you can say web application suspicious uh, activity, weird or, or, or potential malicious injection attack. Again, we, we come with these four out of the box, but you can apply more. So what does that mean? What's going on? Let's say we do have our uh, injection attack. I'm not gonna go ahead and create the rule because that might take too long. And with live demos, my experience is sometimes uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't flow your way in terms of a live demo. But what I, what I would like to show you is that when you do generate a rule and particular let me close this here. Again, live demo, my apologies. It'll show you all the signals that, that might have triggered that rule, uh, if it's a high, low, or, or critical severity, things of that nature, risk scores, and so on. You can leverage this information to build your, your timeline of a potential threat. And this will facilitate that, that finding that needle in the haystack so you get a quicker mean time to resolution for threat detection and prevention. Before something like this, DevOps would just more than likely fix their code and leave it as is. And the SOC folks would, might, they might not know this issue existed unless it came from a different log or a different source of, of, of some sort. Now with the marrying of the two, you can get all that rich information in addition to HTTP requests that the code is doing and build these timelines so that you can see if and when a potential threat is happening. Now, hopefully I, I did not, now I'm still sharing. I effectively went through what my slides were talking about and, and building um, said signal detection. I wanted to open it up to questions now because I know we're running up on the clock here, uh, but hopefully that presented some some clarity on how you can leverage APM beyond the the general observability play where you're you're tracking logs uh, of your infrastructure or servers or network or things of that nature and and how you can take it to the next level and actually help facilitate threat detection. Uh, because this day and age with everybody forced to work remotely, uh, two things that, that I personally have seen propagate to, to the forefront of need is, is security and performance monitoring. And with our release of 7.6, we kind of marry, again, we marry the two into a, a single solution stack that uh, you guys could leverage if you have a last. And if you don't, uh, that's why me and my colleagues are here and, and Cap Gemini. We can all uh, help facilitate you getting your hands on some elastic uh, trial and whatnot. Um, I have a slide here later in terms of if you guys want to learn a little bit more about elastic, we have great training and uh, things of that nature. So we're here to help you. Um, and I hope that was, uh, that was helpful for you guys. So Rajesh or Ayush or Faith, I'm not sure who I'm swinging it back. I think it was Rajesh. My apologies, man. Yeah, I think we're opening it up back for questions. Right, right. Let me uh, stop sharing and check the chat because I know I asked you guys to do a little bit. Not seeing any questions in the chat or in the Q&A right now. That just means Rajesh and I answered everybody's question and we, we just did that creative a, a presentation, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do see a few people had put a plus that they've heard of elastic or touched it um would love to hear or, or read a little bit more if you guys are willing to share on on how you're using elastic if if you're leveraging any of our our uh security solutions nope it's a quiet tuesday i, I presume so Sayush, one of the things that I saw, I don't know if you're actually uh, live on the microphone as 
you pointed out Elastic and Enterprise Discovery and also Knowledge Graph. Uh, if you want to give like a few more words, maybe I can just jump on top of that. Give me a little bit more context to me or Ruben can. Oh yeah, sure, um, Arajesh, right? So I see a lot of our use cases, right, are beyond uh, the basic logging aspect of Elastic, right? And uh, where we see a couple of use cases come up, especially with our enterprise clients, right? Um, and uh, even on the banking side or wealth management side is, how are we leveraging this, um, you know, the optimized storage of Elastic, right? Um, the graph ability of this tool and also, yeah, building the semantic layer, right? Which becomes the enterprise data discovery uh, tool, so to speak. And it also enables data governance or even like a better governance Right. So, so what's your take on that, uh, Rajesh and Ruben? So maybe I can start off. So the way that I would look at this, right, is you, once you actually have done the pre-processing, uh, we've done some of that semantic processing already. Um, so from the standpoint of how we're looking at graphs, it's working with, with data that's somewhat standardized. Uh, and what we're looking for is adjacencies and connections and so on and so forth to come to the root cause analysis uh, thing, right? So that's how I'd look at the graph piece. On the, um, um, I, for, I didn't quite catch, Ayush, what the second question was other than the graph one, the use cases one. Yeah, this was on the enterprise uh, data search or kind of the search capabilities, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say that, you know, um, uh, Elastic is, is basically, a, a, a extremely, I should say, I shouldn't say basically, it's an excellent uh, search platform. And one of the many things it does is also sort of helps us with the cybersecurity analytics in terms of helping us um, look for um, um, sort of structuring data to bring out trends and issues and so on and so forth that can be this fed to, to, to Kibana to visualize, right? Or to threshold and visualize uh, so the way that I would look at it is that we're looking at a particular capability of a broad search platform like Elastic to drive the cybersecurity analytics use cases. I think that, um, that Ruben will have a much more elegant way of explaining it than I do. Yeah, I'll try to um, say it in a different light because Rajesh, that was great. Our DNA as a company, as a people, we, we were built upon search. I mean, Elastic is a search company. Uh, I, I went into APM today, but the, the underlying tone of the APM capabilities is just allowing you to search for data in a different light, right? Our machine learning is allowing you to search for anomalies at a quicker rate instead of sitting there and sifting through 20, 30 uh, screens of logs and things of that nature. Um, our security features are allowing you to search for uh, potential uh, threats or, or or um, prevention of threats that might have already gotten into the system, you can sort of cut it off at the pass and, and take that infected uh, endpoint offline. Um, so all the underlying bits is search, is just how we present or how the end user consumes it. They might not realize uh, at the forefront that it's search, but behind the scenes, we are allowing them to search uh, better, uh, more efficiently, uh, and quicker. Okay. Yep. That was good. Um, another question, right, um, is so Elastic does have a cloud um, subscription or a solution, uh, which is ECE, right? And um, I see that uh, as a deployable product, um, even for like banking clients where um, the sensitivity towards going public cloud is kind of goes through a lot of infosec checks, right? So uh, there is an aspect of EC being uh, locally under a VPC or a kind of a VNet environment for a banking client. So Ruben, is there a way you can kind of shed some light on the deployment aspects of going on cloud um, versus uh, what you have seen for other blank, uh, you know, banking clients? Yeah, for sure. Uh, there has been quite a bit of a push for cloud adoption. Again, because of the times that we live in now, it, it's almost mandatory if you want to keep your business going. Uh, but we do have our cloud offering that we run in um, Azure, GCP, or AWS. And that's our Elasticsearch service, our ESS um, offering. 
Now, if you want a cloud-like uh, experience, but you want to manage and orchestrate it yourself, that's where our, our ECE or Elastic Cloud Enterprise or Enterprise Cloud, yeah, Elastic Cloud Enterprise uh, would be deployed on your on-prem. Um, and that on-prem can be wherever you'd like. Uh, it could be virtually, it could be bare metal, um, it could be a hybrid solution. Effectively, the, the benefit of having our cloud offering, whether it be on-prem or in the, in the traditional cloud space, is that the, the orchestration and to some degree the infrastructure is, is easier to manage or you don't need to manage it at all, right? So you can have one or many clusters that are managed from a single interface by one full-time employee that might not even be dedicated to Elastic. And that one person can manage, you know, orders of magnitude of, of clusters. I mean, internally within Elastic, we use EC to manage our Elastic system as a whole. And I think we have a handful of um, admins that manage, manage it. And that's only because of the different time zones that we need to administer to. Otherwise, it could be just a couple of folks that are managing, you know, hundreds of, of, of clusters. I hope that answered your question. If not, uh, I, I can get a little bit more deeper into it. Oh, yep, it did. Um, yeah, Ruben, thanks for that. So I don't see any more uh, questions here. Uh, so Faith, I think we're good on this one. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, if you joined through the uh, Mayor Virtual User Group, I will be sending you um, a follow-up email shortly uh, with a recording of the video. And um, we hope that you tune in next time. Again, in the chat, there are some links to uh, Capgemini's Insights and Data Meetups groups. So uh, thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you again. All right. Bye, everybody.